what with the comic book code and all. Tell me, do you have a girlfriend, Brody? Had one. We just broke up. The thing. Is this dork made of orange rock like the rest of his body? <laughs> it's a superhero secret. <laughs> Welcome back to Box Popcast, the weekly pseudo academic roundtable of pop culture analysis with drinking and swearing. My name is Christopher Maverick, but you can call me Mav, and I am once again here with my co hosts, Hannah and Wayne. How's it going, guys? Wayne's back. Hey, Wayne. Hey, Mav. <laughs> yeah, I've missed a few. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I think we should forever get rid of the question, how's it going, and instead replace it with a new fun question every episode. And this <gasps> question could be, what is your opinion on Valentine's Day? Because that's what this is, right? It's our Valentine's Day episode. Our, you're right. This is our Valentine's Day episode. I, I like Valentine's Day. I know maybe that I'm wrong and people are going to be like, oh, but it's constructed Hallmark holidays. I'm like, Look, I like chocolate. I like dates. You know, I like sex. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And yes, I'm aware that it's 2021 and everything's closed and I'm not really going anywhere for Valentine's Day because places are not a thing anymore but look i like it okay give me presents okay by dates do you mean like going on a date or do you mean dates is in the food i mean i have no problem with dates the food but i meant going on a date like you know valentine's day is a nice day where you can go and celebrate and you're like hey let's go out to a nice dinner or movie or something dancing and then you eat and drink expensive food you open presents you go home you have sex it sounds fun and yeah i get the places aren't a thing so you know at least that part of it's off the table but but i like valentine's day but on the other hand for clarification um stephanie my wife who's not on the show today it's not that she hates valentine's day it's that she doesn't care about it one way or the other so as a funny story there was a point where it's like uh and it was like the first year we were married I was talking to another random friend of mine um, in grad school who was like, well, this is your first year as a married couple. You know, do you have reservations for Valentine's Day? It's like, no, we'll go to this, like we, our favorite sushi restaurant and we'll do this. And she's like, well, you need to do something really, really special. And I was like, well, that is really special. And she's like, yeah, but your your wife's going to be expecting something really nice because it's like the first one together and as a married couple. And I'm like, my wife doesn't know it's Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne, and you Wayne, better not tell her. <laughs> right. Wayne, no, no. Well, no, I, no, Wayne, better than any of you know Stephanie like Steph doesn't care about any of that bullshit right. and has you know, <laughs> you know like like if I get a present for Valentine's Day it's because sometime on February 13th Stephanie saw a commercial that said you know Valentine's Day special tomorrow and she went oh shit and then like you know went out that morning to Target and bought me something because because <laughs> she's not tracking that sort of thing <laughs> she is very not again anti you know there's no performative girliness or femininity about Valentine's Day for my wife that's all me so that's my feelings of Valentine's Day. I'm so glad I asked this question <laughs> yes <laughs> That's how I'm doing. Uh, see, isn't how how you're doing better? <laughs> how do you feel about Valentine's Day, Hannah? <laughs> well, you know, actually, usually I'm a grump about it. I feel like there probably is a recording of me from like the past three years whining about it. But you know what? It's COVID times. <laughs> Something has to break up the terribleness. Why not eat chocolate or buy special coffee or an expensive wine and enjoy it from the comfort of your home? And right, if you exactly. enjoy Valentine's Day, I'm not going to be grumpy about it because you know what? If you have joy, you should hold on to it because God <laughs> knows we need it right now. I mean, seriously, it's not even that much of an odd. It's just like God knows. <laughs> Wayne, are you going to answer too, or do you want to just I, move I, on? I'm going to stay at home and hold on to my joy. <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking about this week? We're, we're talking about sex this week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this, this this was your topic. Yeah. I, well, I mean, all of ours really. I, we we talked about. Uh, I, I, we're coming back to, to comics and superheroes and the the whole idea of you know sexuality in in superheroes. They wear skin tight costumes. They are idealized bodies, you know, all that stuff. But uh, for the most part, you know, in most mainstream comics, Marvel, DC, because of the code and blah, 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 and all kinds of other stuff, we don't actually see a lot of sex. Um, 
Uh, that obviously in, in independent books and books that weren't done by the code or whatever that that changed. But uh, but it, it just I think it's an interesting topic. It's the, the sexuality of these characters and how us as fans are are drawn to this. You know what about it speaks to us or doesn't speak to us or canalizes us or turns us on or whatever. And uh, we happen to know somebody who has edited an entire academic book about the subject, so we invited her on the show. <laughs> Uh, so we, we are we are welcoming back. Hi, Anna. Welcome back to the show. Hello. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, I mean, Wayne gave a little bit of away, but like, what? What? Well, actually, I guess that's a weird question with sex. I was going to say, what is your special interest here? I'm like, well, but it, it was a show about sex. Uh, <laughs> oh, I have many. I have many interests. Yes. Um, but um, I am uh, Dr. Anna Papard. Um, Wayne is referring to my recent academic anthology with the University of Texas Press called Super Sex: Sexuality, Fantasy, and the superhero in which we talk about many many interesting things it is available for as an ebook or as a physical copy right now and i do a lot of writing about gender and representation um sexuality in superhero comics and other media favorite Mm -hmm. topic of mine obviously and super excited to talk about it today Mm -hmm. and there's a link to anna's book in the show notes um because you know why not it's a good book i've read it you sent me a pre-press copy even before it came out and it's awesome so everybody could read it's not just you it's um several people yeah that um who have who are writing different different things about comic books superheroes well superheroes from comic books but also related media Mm -hmm. and how sexuality is portrayed in them and and as i said um i think last week's show uh, i think i said this hannah today's show is going to be you know, in part, what is the best superpower for having sex and why is it super stretching? Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure that that is the one joke I remember from like the Fantastic Four with Jessica Alba. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So <laughs> because of, I mean, if you had to pick one, I mean, so I guess it's like, what else do you pick? Yeah, well, right? I, and, <laughs> and, and which brings up, I, you know, Anna and I had an exchange uh, messages I know, a month or so ago. Uh, speaking of Fantastic Four, I asked her if she'd ever seen the, the Marvel Fitness book that came out in the, <laughs> the 1970s that mm-hmm. shows you know, superheroes teaching how to do exercises. And there's this one page of Mr. Fantastic doing push-ups. And I have always assumed that Sue is in that picture. <laughs> okay. Wait, I've got, I've got something. <laughs> up, yeah. Even when I was young, I made that assumption. So, uh, <laughs> When you sent me that, though, because I had actually not seen it before, surprisingly, and immediately looking at the picture so he's doing like a downward dog yoga pose and you would mm-hmm. assume that like sue's on the bottom but like my mind did definitely go to her being <laughs> behind him rather than because i was like the pose could kind of go either way and that was yeah, definitely the yeah. sexier option yeah. <laughs> so yeah Well, if we're going to assume that stretchiness is the best super sex power as well, I will say that the sexiest scene that I can think of with Mr. Fantastic is one from Kirby um, and Lee Fantastic Four, where he's entangled with Namor in a very sensual manner. So perhaps stretchiness is sexy, but not in the way you're necessarily thinking. Well, well, in the way that I was thinking. So so, so this is weird. Again, this conversation with Stephanie before we recorded this episode. So we were she's like what are you guys doing a show on tonight and i told her and she's like well super stretchiness she's like that's such a guy answer and i was like well what do you mean now remember steph's not a big comic book fan she's like well she's like sex is not just about how how long you can make your penis and i was like yes but super stretchiness is not just that like he can literally do anything with his body and and so i showed her a picture of like just him just wrapped around Ben Grimm like 18 billion times. And I'm like, see, mm-hmm. you know, you can do anything here. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> like there's, I, I, there's a lot that goes on. Given Reed's personality, I just kind of assumed that he would stretch his penis into the bedroom while he was still in the lab working. Yeah. Well, I think, okay, I think that he's feels prob- very watchman. <laughs> yeah. I think he's probably the worst. He personally is probably really the worst person to have sex with. It's a waste of yeah. a power. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, oh no, no, okay. I'm I'm not defending him, but um have you like met the other like comic book heroes? They're sure. all like like um Tony Stark, no thank you. Like <laughs> goodbye. Um <laughs> And in fact, like, I, like, one of the few, like, Marvel actually acknowledgments of sex, I feel like, is, like, Tony Stark having sex with random women uh, at the beginning of Iron Man in the movies. And 
That's an experience. <laughs> well, I will say that Super Sex has not lived up to my hopes and dreams in the Marvel adaptations thus far. But I will point out, because I have to do a requisite plug for my Bay Nightcrawler, that he's got, you know, <laughs> the ability to hold you many different ways, and he feels like velvet, so, and you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's not where I was going. That's not where I, I, I was going to point out. He's also got a prehensile tail. But, you I was know, thinking which, of that, too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I, I mean, and, you know, for any listeners that we have not lost already. <laughs> 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 this is not going to be the only thing that we talk about here, but I think it is kind of the the place people start, you know, because I remember having this conversation, I don't know, with friends when I was like 13, 12, yeah. you know, if I had superpowers, I'd use them for sex in this way, not necessarily entirely understanding the mechanics of sex yet, but, <laughs> but, but like it is something that you're sort of led to start thinking about just by the very physical nature of what superhero comics are. I mean, yeah, I definitely agree with that. Although I've often been, I'm part of, part of the reason I wanted to do the super sex book is that I've often been frustrated by kind of the narrowness of those conversations. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, You know, the absolutely. fact that we do go straight to like, oh, wouldn't it be great to be able to grow your penis to an enormous size? And I'm like, yeah, or you could use your Reed Richards power to touch someone a hundred different ways at once, which is also super mm. sexy, but that's not usually where we go with it. Right. Mm. And, and it goes to some of the imagination uh, that, you, you know, how into superheroes are you? Because my thought was not immediately just the penis thing, right? Because like, even when I said it to Stefan, I was like, no, no, I'd also want the woman to have that power too, because there's so much that you can do if you have super stretching, <laughs> you know, but, but also, you know, there's things like, um, I remember there was, um, you know, we've, we've talked about fanfic on this show before. This is years and years ago. I was in college. Um, I was reading like, um, um, superhero fanfic news groups, you know, where people were, and somebody had, there was like one place where people were submitting their erotic fan fiction things for like other people to critique. And one person had written a sex scene that was Jean Grey having sex with Wolverine. That's a common pairing that happens that people ship. And, yeah. but for the fact that they called them Jean and Logan in, you know, those are the names. There was nothing specific. I mean, it wasn't like bad or anything. It was just like, oh, here's a woman having sex with a man. And you go, all right then, but why are they Jean and Wolverine, right? Why are they Phoenix and Wolverine? Because to it, it, you know, it's sort of you want to know. Well, how are they using their tele her telekinesis? How you know? How is he using? He doesn't really have any powers that aren't just his physical body. He's got you know, but is is he doing something particularly feral? Like you want to know those sort of things, or it's well, almost what's the point of using those characters? Right, right, and 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 that was that was like my first, like one of the times I first started really thinking about it because my thought when I imagine you know Reed and Sue's sex life, which is obviously something that I do all the time, you know, I do assume that he's becoming lots and lots of different shapes, and there's like you know eighteen billion um, prehensile protrusions coming from everywhere, and like that's that's how I would expect it to happen. I also expect that there are force field bubbles involved. That's just yeah, because why wouldn't there be? Yeah. <laughs> Any telekinesis sex scene that doesn't use the telekinesis to, at the very least, make the partner experience the orgasm from the perspective of both genders is just a waste. Which, sure. By the way, I just finished watching an episode of Fringe that does just that, which is not really superheroes, but they have superpowers. So yeah. mm -hmm. there we are. Yeah. I think it's odd. And this goes into the history of fanfic, but also, you know, even going back as far as like Tijuana Bibles this is stuff for my dissertation. I think it's odd um, that people people are have this, you know, connection of superheroes or kid stuff. And we've talked about that on the show many times. But I think they've always even during the staunch, you know, the strongest times of the comic book code there, they've always sort of subtly invited you to um, to wonder that even something as simple as Superman, Superman picks up Lois and flies around and kisses her. And then immediately, if you're, a, you know, if you're a pubescent boy in the 60s and your mind doesn't go to how are they doing it in the clouds? Then something's wrong with you, right? Like, like that, that, that's kind of what you're, what you're wondering, isn't it? I have found it 
to be very surprising how firmly people are in denial about the possibilities of super sex. I mean, the discourse, and I would say the anxiety around whether the vision will or won't have a penis and the WandaVision television show, I feel like it's really yeah. representative of that. Like mm -hmm. people are all sort of tittery about it and just like, oh my God, I hadn't thought about it before. Oh my God, you're so weird for thinking about that. Oh my God, <laughs> how could they even be in a relationship if he doesn't have a penis and just all these super heteronormative, like judgy, like really prudish questions. And I'm just like, okay, I don't think I'm the weird one here. I think you're the weird one if you weren't thinking about that. <laughs> it's a show about them being married and having kids. Of course you're thinking about it. Like, and to be worried about to be worried about his penis instead of excited about the fact that he's an artificial magical being that could have sex with you any way you wanted. Why are you so right. hung up on him having a normal human male penis? This is a strange presumption so well, limiting I, yeah, it vibrates. I, it's like its entire thing yeah, right. he, is, he is a man who's an object he is literally a sex toy unto himself yeah. this is exciting not terrifying although maybe well, terrifying for him given the uh, developments, yeah. developments in that theory well, yeah. and, and I, I guess yeah no, I, I, I guess I was just I, you know, wondering you know, those of us who've read this stuff our entire lives and, and fought out these possibilities, and you know, maybe just people who are into fantasy or sci-fi or any of these things in general, have we just had the ability to think about this stuff more, or, or you know, it's been presented to us in this form more than people who aren't part of this world? Like, if you've never read superheroes, you've never thought about the possibilities of, I wonder what it'd be like to have sex with somebody who can stretch. <laughs> um, <laughs> does that, you know, make us more open-minded to these possibilities, or just make us more perverse in our expectations? of these possibilities. And I guess, you know, and a bigger question, what is it about the superhero genre that, that brings about these questions? Like, you know, if you went to a convention for fans of old Western novels, do they talk a lot about how Billy the Kid has sex? Or or is this something that's really kind of specific to, to comics and superheroes? And, and if so, why? <laughs> I think they do. If a uh, media type is very... I don't want to say, I don't want to say realistic. If it's very grounded in the natural, right? Mm. You're not going to worry about the mechanics as much. Do I know how yeah. Billy the Kid has sex? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I can figure it out. You know, yeah. probably a lot and, like and, how I do. But and um, and I've yeah. certainly read Western books that have you know, pretty intense sex scenes in them. But right, you, you, right. you add the super heroic to it and there's this whole other... You start you know, worrying about the mechanics of it is what yeah. I think it comes down to. Whereas, like, certainly... Certainly shipping is a thing in other media besides just superhero comics, right? Like you, it, there, there's always going to be the, oh, well, are my favorite two characters secretly together in, you know, um, I mean, I'm here. Okay. Harry Potter. Harry Potter is something that is, they're not superheroes, but they've got special powers. So immediately I'm wondering, well, you know, how do they use magic while they're having sex? That is a thing that comes up while you're while you're reading a Harry Potter book. It's a thing that comes up when you're reading Twilight. It's a thing that comes up when you're reading well, Wizard it, of Oz. Yeah. I mean, it's not even like I mean, in Harry Potter, it's like I would say it's pretty buried. Like, I mean, you obviously like sexuality permeates the books, but like, um, I think that you could describe Harry Potter's relationships as like the blandest of heterosexuality possible. Um, <laughs> And, well, but that's the writing, like, not you, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Like, it's the writing. Yeah. Like, like you know, the, there are whole like essays on the internet about how like you you can definitely see like the energy between Sirius Black and Lupin, and how mm -hmm. like somehow like then the there you know in the Half-Blood Prince the perfunctory heterosexuality, um, you know, with Lupin and Tonks, even though there's like literally no se anyway. Not a point. We don't, but like, but you know, like Twilight, it's totally there. Cause like, um, I think like part of the reason why people got so weird about Twilight for very like different reasons, depending on your viewpoint was because it did tackle sexuality, uh, in ways that are perhaps not the uh, best. Um, mm -hmm. but like, I mean, like Edward won't have sex with Bella while she's a human. Cause he's like, I will kill you. And she's like, but I want it. Mm hmm. Um, well, like, yeah, and people are uncomfortable with sort of the female girl exercising, yeah, yeah potentially yeah. self-destructive sexual desire there for good and bad right. reasons. Yeah, which actually, like the the someone point out, you know, I, I read uh, not Harry Potter, I mean, I did, I read Twilight as like a teen girl because it came out when I was a teen girl, and it took me until like recently when someone else pointed out that like actually Bella can be read as an interesting character just because she is extremely active and knows what she wants. And that is not necessarily the case for a lot of 
other teen girl heroines in like that very obvious sexual way. Yeah, I mean, the obvious sort of difference though between something like Twilight or Harry Potter to a large extent versus superhero genre as it's traditionally constituted is that we're talking about a male directed and predominantly male created mm-hmm. genre and mm-hmm. I think a lot of the one of the things that we talk about sort of as a theme in the super sex books throughout it is the intensely contradictory presence and absence of super sex so mm-hmm. I think the superhero genre starting in its comic book form lends itself particularly well to subversive or queer sexualities mm. or diverse sexualities just in general. And yet there's an intense anxiety about that because of the market for this genre, which has been throughout its history, predominantly like cis straight men. Mm-hmm. So you get this sort of like obsessive absence of sexuality and this obsession with mm. shutting down conversations about it. And you also get a lot of shame associated with talking about it, which manifests like in something like the mall rat scene, you know, talking about Ben Grimm's penis, which is sort of so infused with shame. And this can only be sort of like a humorous conversation. That's just a joke about the adolescent mm-hmm. masculinity of comic book fans. And that's all it can be mm-hmm. because to say otherwise would admit the inherent queer possibilities of the superhero genre. And that is very uncomfortable mm-hmm. for the main audience and main producers of these texts to mm-hmm. admit. Right. And almost, in t- I mean, well, not almost very much intentionally so like the the CCA the comics code authority was set up in large part to reinforce standardized heterosexual norms yeah. yes. um as yeah. as they were as they were seen in 1955 right um yeah. so there's very clearly a very decided gay does not exist good girls remain chaste until marriage that goes from 1955 through 1984 ish, 89, 89, I think. Well, it depends on direct market. Uh, 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 well, direct yeah, market. Yeah, 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 yeah. You end up with like sudden acknowledgement that Starfire and Dick Grayson have sex in like 1984, as though, of course, they're like 22 years old and living together. Yeah, they <laughs> they've done stuff. You know, like that's in like, terms of the you know, comics code mm-hmm. itself, though. Yeah, still officially oh, yeah, yeah. like yeah, gayness yeah, is yeah. not yeah. on the books until 89. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. But it took a long time for people to even try to ignore it. Right. Like there's and so much so and we'll get into this maybe a little bit, but even after the code was re- rewritten to allow for and I'm not even getting into like anything n- non heteronormative yet when the code was rewritten to allow for characters to have sex in the late 80s and 89 is when that's explicitly allowed. There's a story in the 90s where Peter Parker makes it very clear that he and Gwen Stacy never actually slept together in their stories from the 70s. Why? It's not a problem anymore. But he's like, no, 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 no. We we never had sex. I'm like, really? Like, you could just retcon that. But <laughs> but they didn't want to acknowledge it. And and, and that story is like massively. Pro- that's that's in the story where it turns out Gwen had a one night affair with the Green Goblin. Which is a horrible, horrible story for uh, <laughs> yeah. for many other reasons. Uh, but yeah. there's but, so um, many horrible Spider-Man storylines. Yeah, that just go anyway. Go ahead. But yeah, uh, but yeah, it, it was a, it was very much a we cannot crush the dream that Spider-Man was a virgin until he was married, which made no sense. Well, it's um, really funny the way certain characters can get away with certain things and certain other characters can't. Like, I mean, part of the reason why I think sexuality is a really in- interesting lens just to sort of look at the cultural identity of any character, like the character of Tony Stark, Iron Man in 80s comics. If you read like any of his 80s comics, he's sleeping with a different woman every yeah. issue. <laughs> Yeah. Like, and it's very well, clear he's, that he's sleeping with them. He takes them out to dinner and then he they wake up at his place in his bed. Yeah. And it's like every issue. Yes, they had a nap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but a a character like a Spider-Man, part of the character's mm-hmm. identity is that he has to be this more innocent, virginal character. And you even see that reflected in something like the Marvel swimsuit specials, where if you go back mm-hmm. to those, you will see that all of pretty much all of the pictures of Spider-Man he's featured in every single one. All of his are very chaste, like compared mm-hmm. to the depictions of a lot of the other male superheroes. And it's very interesting. Which was odd, by the way, because... So, so this is weird off, you know, behind the panel. This is mentioned a little bit in super sex. It's also mis- mentioned in, in Anna's dissertation, but at the point in comics in which those swimsuit specials were published, Spider-Man was married, had been for several years. Mm-hmm. And during this point in comics, Mary Jane, his wife was depicted as having an extremely hypersexualized libido. This was like when McFarlane's drawings, amazing Spider-Man around the 300 issues. There's many issues where, She's, you know, she's extremely flirtatious. 
they clearly have a very active and implied rather kinky sex life. It's implied that they, you know, that they do use his powers and stuff in the bedroom. And yet his depiction outside of those books in those swimsuit specials, it was very much he, you know, he is the more innocent and, you know, family friendly hero, I guess, you know, but it's okay for her to be the demon because she's female. I don't, it's it, very it, it, strange. <laughs> I've thought about Spider-Man in the swimsuit specials a lot because it really does stand out how chaste he is. I mean, he's there in like Bermuda shorts with like no visible bulge, whereas like mm-hmm. in like, this, I don't even know if it's the same issue, but one of the issues, you know, you get that that um, one of Captain America wearing like the Speedo, like lying face mm-hmm. first on the towel where there's like a visible dent between his butt cheeks. Like, I mean, <laughs> it's just like Captain America is very sort of queer coded in the swimsuit specials and very mm-hmm. hypersexualized, whereas Spider-Man is very very chaste that is america's ass so, mm-hmm. I, yeah. <laughs> although you know in the movies i'm like honestly has captain america ever had like a relationship with any woman that like lasted more than like a flirtation in a day based on let's talk about seen? that one uh, but i think he has it was so there's so you're, t- you're talking about the the moment in so there's this moment in um winter soldier where natasha realizes wait a minute you've been on ice for it's like you've never kissed the girl before and he says i'm 100 years old i'm not dead you know like i think captain america totally had sex after he got bought out i also think it was with falcon but that's a different issue <laughs> but, 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 but well, um, I, was, I was yeah i was thinking of peggy and sharon well and that's a question like peggy he clearly doesn't sleep with before he well she thinks he dies but before he goes into the ice i'm okay with that right i'm okay with believing he was enough of a nerd that maybe he was even a virgin before then though i'm not sure because i read that date that they go on to the world's fair as um not the first time i think bucky every once in a while you know goes out and hires his friend steve a a hooker because he needs to right like like i'm not sure there but i definitely don't think he is without other relationships until he goes back in time and endgame i I, you know he clearly kisses sharon and I'm not sure more didn't happen. It's kind I, of weird because yeah, I mean, if, we yeah, only I, see I that. Didn't connect. If, he out, if he went out with the Howling Commandos on leave in Paris. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Although, you know, maybe like, I don't, I don't know. I, I definitely like felt like there were maybe some demisexual vibes there with Captain America. Um, mm-hmm. Like, like the, you know, I'm saving my dances for like the right partner kind of thing. Um, and I think you, mm-hmm. I think, I think that the wonderful thing about superheroes is you can read a lot of these characters many different ways. Um, sure, sure. Um, but I, I don't know, like, but you know, like my in bringing this up, it's like you know, in the movies, um, the way they portray the character, it feels like in some ways Captain America is like I don't want to say chase because that's the wrong word, but like he he has he wants to make an emotional connection mm-hmm. in the like relationships we see, but like for whatever reason, filmmakers and and to to like a degree that like comic book writers like they have an obsession with keeping Spider Man a sixteen year old boy, mm-hmm. like the movies like reboot. <laughs> Right. over and over again they keep citing like we w- we want that teenage like character we want mm-hmm. you know we want him to like be like this kind of like young foil and that you know like they were, i think they at one point like in the comics like they were like well we couldn't have him married to mary jane and like, like grow up because mm-hmm. that's just not spider-man and right. that's just it's just so odd to me because i actually i actually like the character's been around yeah yeah the character spider-man's been around for 60 years he's a high schooler for three of them i think Mm -hmm. it's like the vast majority like 90 percent of the character of spider-man stories he's in college or later um yeah most of them he's 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 very much an adult they they do really want the teen spider-man in the movies for reasons that you know i don't really understand well he he resonates so much with adolescence so i mean i can understand wanting to keep going back to that version of the character as like I mean, even though it's not the longest tenured version of the character, it's still the most iconic version of the character. Although I will say as a teenager watching the Tobey Maguire ones and just like watching like his hard life and just like the constant knocks, uh, I still actually feel that way as an almost 30 year old. And I think mm. maybe it's because we're millennials and life is bad. Um, <laughs> but, but like, you know, they're, they're like, we want him to struggle and, and do all these things. And and the thing is like, you can struggle and not be 16 years old. You can. Right. Oh, well, that was, yeah. I mean, you, you mentioned the thing where they didn't want him to be married. They, you know, brand new day oh. was, was all about turning him into, well, we need to make him single. We can't have him be divorced because that will make him seem even older. And we don't want him to be married anymore. Cause he's not relatable. And you know, how are people going to relate to them? And I was reading, that going at the time is like 
I'm like 40. I, I relate to him now because he's, you know, a 40 year old dude whose who's marriage isn't always perfect. Let's yeah. Give me more of that. You know, <laughs> like, like that, that this is know. A, you know, like the prohibition, you kid, you've got miles, you know, prohibition on marriage, like in superhero comics. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. it's related to the super sex stuff in the yeah. sense that I think there's an assumption that if you're, if the character is married, they're boring. And like, that's boring to writers from a storytelling perspective because you lose the will they or won't they or whatever. But you can see it from a super sex perspective as well. Like the assumption is the sexual possibilities are boring now because there's an assumption that what was interesting about the sexual possibilities was the tension and possibility. And that's considered spent once the character is married, mm-hmm. which makes no sense. Mm-hmm. And yet I think that's part of well, the assumption that's, a, that's going on there. And that's yeah. a very yes. mononormative view, which is, which has pervaded most of comics with the exception of recent issues of, of X-Men and in humans, which, you know, which very specifically do deal with the fact that, you know, ethical non-monogamy does exist and apparently is just the way of the mutants now. And, and certainly is the way of like, uh, in humans about five years ago, backtracked on the fact that, you know, you know, black bolts, not just married to Medusa. She, he has like five wives. We just never talked about the other four mm. and Medusa started dating Johnny storm. And it's like, I was like, are you sure? But you know, your husband's my friend. And she's like, no, nah, he's cool with it. You know? And that, and that becomes, so he's that's never a said question. anything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> ah, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and if he does, you'll die. So it won't matter. So, um, <laughs> but um, that becomes um, at least a way of, you know, there was like a sudden addressing of polyamory as existing in Marvel comics lore suddenly basically in the last five or six years like since the mid 20 teens um they also started dealing with the fact that oh by the way loki is both pansexual and non-binary you know he always was we just never mentioned it before and (laughs) and Mm -hmm. i mean weird retconning but i'm glad they did it well the loki one i the loki one i like because it's actualized like we see him enacting his bisexual identity but (laughs) Uh, my complaint about the queer slant and the current X-Men stuff is that so much of it has been suggested and so little of it has been actualized on panel. Like the polyamory yeah. stuff has all been off panel. So Not anymore. Are you still reading it? Well, which thing are you thinking of? Oh, polyamory? No, they in the last couple of issues, um, they've made it quite clear that Gene and Logan are sleeping together and Gene and Scott are sleeping together and everybody knows. Yeah, but I've, Scott and I Logan like aren't Scott and Logan aren't together. They've hinted see, that's been the one that's off panel. I think they are. And I like and I refuse to read any other yeah. way. There there's a very explicit scene where they're going to the beach and Scott's like, Well, you know, Gene will be there in a bikini and Logan's like, eh. And then Scott's like, I'll be there in a speedo. And Logan's like, eh. <laughs> you know, so they're hinting, but you're right. I know. That's, that's I'm, been I'm, off panel. And I wish they'd just go out and I just want to like, I yearn for the day where I pick up an X-Men comic and it's just like, I don't need to see anything, but just give me the morning after where there's this giant double size king, king size bed with Logan and Emma and Scott and Jean in there. And sure, go bring in Madeline and Mariko too, or whoever. I don't care. You know, <laughs> like, like, just acknowledge just, it. Just yeah, let yeah, it go. No, I, I'm like happy that they're doing this right now, but I'm just been frustrated by like I think in retrospect, people are going to look back and be like, "This was a little bit queer baity and a little bit lack of actualization." I mean, even mm-hmm. in something like you know, mm-hmm. Kitty Pride is finally by canonically, and yet she's not kissing Rachel or Liliana. She's like kissing some rando girl at a two tattoo parlor instead of actualizing those queer bonds that people mm-hmm. really want to see. Yeah, <laughs> see, and I, and I wasn't even sure that the same thing there. Like she. Is she bi or was she willing to kiss one girl because yeah, she's exactly. really happy one time? And yeah, and I think you have a point there. I I mean, it would make a lot more sense that she was, especially given that, like, I want to give a little bit of credit to the current X-Men series in that we can be critical of it. They are going further than any mainstream comic has ever gone before mm. as far as like dealing with non-normative sexuality. Uh, but, you don't you think it's going further than Young Avengers? Um, yes, I think Young Avengers went further than anything had up until that point. But all Young Avengers basically did was acknowledge that, you know, gay people do exist in this universe. Good to know, you know, they can they can even get married. You know, like I think there were I, but I think that there are more possibilities in the X-Men world currently. Yeah. 
than there were in Young Avengers. I do think Young yeah, Avengers and, is, and, is especially a yeah. very a very big um you know not just the, not just the fact that there's a lesbian member and that there are two gay uh, members who, who are a couple. Also, Kate Bishop's view of you know her owning her own sexuality throughout that series, I thought was great mm. um, as well. So I, I am I the only straight I, person I, on the team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, like, and, and then, and, 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 yeah. And Sh- America Chavez tells her too, like, "Oh, honey, I've seen the way you look at me. You're not that straight." Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, right. And, I, I, and, and Kieran Gillen set all that stuff up in Young Avengers. He actualized it in The Wicked and the Divine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and, and I, and I but that's that mainstream. Yeah, and what, that's it. But Marvel, Marvel, still, you know, there, there, there are still limits. This corporate property, I, I think, mm-hmm. uh, whatever intentions the creators have, there are limits what they're allowed to do, code or no code. Right, um, and I, and I wonder if, I mean, for Marvel, it's a lot of you know, Marvel, the comic book group. I think there's a lot of how much can I get away with before anyone at Disney notices? Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'd make an argument for Al Ewing's Guardians of the Galaxy being one of the books that's going the furthest in terms of like LGBTQ2, like, yeah. like sorry. I haven't read just, that. Yeah. But I mean, it, the team is dominated by like LGBT characters, like Star Lord mm-hmm. did come out on panel as bisexual in a relationship mm-hmm. with a man, which is like further than X Men books have gone with Scott and Logan. So. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I yes, just but, but they have by, but they have um um there are other characters in the X-Men who have been very clearly have said they're bisexual. Yeah, and, I, I'm um, I'm way behind on Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, I did I'm see that. Right, Guardians. I, I did see yeah. that Adam Ant joined the team with. Oh. Uh, <laughs> the singer. The, 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 uh, well, it, it's uh Marvel Boy or whatever the name is. Um yeah. showed up on the team. And it's just it's straight out of a, a nineteen eighty two Adam Ant video. He's got the stripes across his face, he's wearing mm-hmm. the jacket. It just you know, as soon as I saw that, it's like, what's Adam Ant doing? This? Oh, it's Marvel Boy. Okay. And Hercules, thank goodness, is back to being a big bisexual after being retconned as straight not too long ago. That was weird. Yeah. Uh, and see that, and that was one of those ones where I, so I guess we can talk a little bit about sexual identity because Hercules was one where they retconned him for no other reason that I can see other than homophobia. Yeah. Like it was very explicitly, no, he's straight. Whatever made you think otherwise? And I'm like, well, these several comics where he wasn't, you know, that's and what made the, me think like, otherwise. Mythological history of the character <laughs> yeah. outside of comics. So, yeah. but it was very much a no, no, no. We're, you know, there's no reason for us to point out that he's straight. We're mm-hmm. just doing it because straight is the only thing that is good. And that was weird in the Hercules case, as opposed to. Like it was, it was extremely inorganic. It was extremely like, no, 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 you must understand gay bad. Like, and I was like, why, why are just not, if, if you really feel that way, just not mention it altogether. Why invalidate these stories for no storyline reason? Um, in, in a very, it, it seemed ham fisted to me. Yeah, for sure. I think that's one of the reasons why that really stands out. And, you know, before that happened to, we did have a version of Hercules that was in a very loving relationship with an alternate universe, um, Wolverine as well. Um, the character I was referring to in X Men, you know, was Prodigy, who is explicitly bisexual and has been stated. Obviously, Iceman has been, um, retconned into gay. And I have problems with how that was done, but I mean, I, you know, now that, it, now that it is, it's fine. Um, who else is there? Um, Bat- Batwoman, Batwoman. Um, the original mm-hmm. Green Lantern, Alan Scott. Um, mm-hmm. Who else? Oh, I should have this like all off the top of my head. I mean, you yeah, know, yeah. Te- technically North Star, although you can argue that he was like straight from his first envisioning, which seemed very clear, even yeah. though it wasn't made explicit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Gay from his first envisioning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, but there's, yeah, there's been, there's been a few of them. Um, I am. Well, we, we've talked about this a little bit, Mav. Um, Stanley, and once again, this is Stanley, you know, speaking of stuff that he wrote 50 years ago or whatever, but the, you know, Percy in the Howling Commandos, he said he yeah. always intended to be a, a gay character. And certainly the character was coded with a lot of 1963, hey, look, he's gay. Yeah. Look at that. <laughs> look, look at that. Look, look at his behavior. He's, he's got a yeah. British accent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, it, but it, but it was though. It was like as clo- it was as far. Assuming we take Stan out of his word, that's as far as he could go under 1963 right, yeah. era comics code. If they had um, filmed the, if they had filmed the movie at the time, they would have cast Paul in. Yes, yeah, it, yeah, very much so. <laughs> now, there's a problem with taking Stan out of his word because Stan stands. Stan's truth is what Stan's truth is at yes. the moment that he's yeah. speaking it. Um, yeah, you know, it, it I, I adore yeah, that man and miss him, but Stan's 
the relationship he, with the truth he, is complicated. He, yeah, his, his memory and his narrative are, are both subject to change. And it wasn't just him being old. It, it, he, he was like that 50 years ago, too. Yeah. It just yeah. <laughs> That's how Stan is, but or was. So what about other characters, though? So we can talk about the explicitness of having the characters. But you, I mean, Anna, you were just talking about things happening off panel, right? Most as we were talking about, most comic book sex happens off panel. Mr. Fantastic and, and Invisible Woman have been married for years, but we don't see them fuck. It's not like a thing that's part of Fantastic Four. We know it ha- happens. They have a couple of children, right? But we don't see it a lot. So, and we don't even really see them kiss that much every once in a while. Um, so what are we looking for for explicit recognition of Kitty Pride's bisexuality? Like, what do we want? Do we do we just need to see her in bed with Rachel? I mean, I think that's a really good question. I would say that for me, it does start with some of that recognition. I mean, it does matter to have characters who are supposed to be bi or lesbian or gay to kiss or hold hands or have explicit gestures of affection on panel. It's not that everybody has to express their relationship in the exact same way. But, you know, I mean, going back to the history of the Young Avengers series, and there being a lot of controversy about the Billy and Teddy characters taking so long to have an on-panel kiss Mm -hmm. and then still continuing conversation about them not sort of having gestures of affection that sort of, you know, happened regularly after that. And a lot has changed with those characters um, in the years since. But I think you do need to have some of that explicit representation in terms of whether you need to have explicit sex scenes. That's where I think you can get into a lot more almost complicated and interesting conversations. Because for myself personally, while I would definitely like superhero comics to be significantly less prudish than they are about showing us a little bit more. And like, I don't mean more like in terms of like a conventional heteronormative pornographic thing. I mean, more in terms of a creative possibilities that these bodies could actually, you know, do way. I would like to see a little bit more of that on panel. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, sort of the spaces for intervention and kind of the possibilities that the genre creates by having some of those absences can be really exciting as well. I mean, we were already talking about the vision earlier, but I mean, the absence of knowing specifically what he and Wanda do in the bedroom can be exciting as well, right? And even the questions of like, does he have a penis? Does he not? Is that how he would experience desire? Would he experience desire in another way? Like I've often thought about writing a fan fiction about those two but like i can't because i actually don't want to limit what they might be able to do and i want to keep yeah. it open-ended and i can't decide which possibility i like best mm-hmm. I, and I, I i agree with that i, I think you know, that the imagination of it the the possibility is a big part of the appeal of this is, is trying to imagine what this would be like rather than nailing it down <laughs> is, uh, i'm assuming i'll, I'll go <laughs> ahead and assume <laughs> so that's a pun <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I can't speak any other way. There's no way to talk about this without me inadvertently saying these things. <laughs> I, 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 too, I wanted to say something about Hercules being ham fisted, but I didn't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it's kind of like in the film series, right? Like, basically, what we've seen in terms of like, LGBTQ representation is um, like the civilian in the end game movie. It, uh, you know, he he speaks about his grief of losing his husband, but it it's like the same criticism that mm. people uh, gave like Star Wars, um, Rise of Skywalker. Like you could edit that out and nothing would change. Yeah, it's it's Anthony Russo, um, the director. Right. It's his director yes. cameo, and yeah, it's it is completely inconsequential to the story in more so than even star Wars. Cause star Wars, it's literally a couple of extras, right? Like at least Russo has gave himself a speaking part. <laughs> like he's, it's he's, he's of- trying to acknowledge it, but you know, like, is it just giving himself something to do? I mean, he also gave his daughter a role. So, um, but, but, um, but I think it's important in that he's acknowledging sort of acceptance in the world, at least in as much as captain America accepts who this random guy with no name is. Um, it's better More than nothing, so. but it's barely better than nothing. Yeah, but it's barely better than nothing as opposed to Star Wars, which I'm not sure is better than nothing. Like the Star Wars, the the lesbian kiss in Star Wars was specifically made so it could be edited out and yeah. without changing the movie for the for the markets where you couldn't do that. And they did. And they oh. just didn't show it. And it was fine. And nothing matters. Those characters literally have no lines. They are just background well, extras. I think I think one of the characters does have a few lines. It, but, okay, whatever. Uh, but, but, dude, <laughs> because you know there's that one fanboy who's going to write us. Um, sure, sure. Uh, but, but your point is, mm-hmm. yes, yes. I agree and with I, you. But I, but I mean, compare that to 
So do we have any for the if we want to move from the comics to the films, there aren't there is not a lot of explicit queerness in the films at all. There's more explicit sexuality. Like we know we know that characters have sex in the Netflix um, shows, right? Like we know very much we've seen Luke and we've seen Luke and Jessica and Luke and um, Claire have sex. We've seen uh, Iron Fist and Colleen Wing have sex. So we know that exists. We know Tony Stark has sex in the Iron Man movies. Daredevil and Elektra have somehow unsexy sex, and I have no idea how they made it as unsexy as it is. (laughs) Right, but there's an there's an acknowledgement, and there is incidental queerness, um, which is there's some odd odd bits of it because you have like um, uh, Jessica Jones's secretary is a transgender woman, and it's never made, and and I and I'm, I'm kind of torn on it because it's never made a big deal of in the series at all. Except that the actress is the actress who portrays her is a transgender woman. And she said, yes, my character is supposed to be a transgender woman. And it's not a big deal because Jessica doesn't care. And, you know, kind of that's what I want the world to be. But on the other hand, did any of you know that before I just mentioned it? To be fair, I didn't watch the Jessica Jones series. Okay, but had you even heard that, right? Like, it's just yeah. <laughs> that that's how would you and, even and, know? And it's been long enough since I watched that. I'm not even being, I can't even visualize the character. Right. She's just this I, black woman that works for her. And, and she's, yeah. you know, she's her sassy secretary. And, and, I, and I may have thought something at the time, but it, it certainly didn't stick. But. Yeah. And how would you, you know, how would you know other than, cause it's not, it's not so much that, you know, the, the character's a stereotype, but oh, okay. All queer people are sassy, but all black women are sassy on television too. So she's just the sassy black secretary and she happens to be transgender and it's a non issue for the series as opposed to Supergirl on CW mm-hmm. where Dreamer is an explicitly transgender character and that is part of the narrative. So what do you want? Do you want it to be, because certainly dreamers should be able to have storylines that aren't, but I'm a trans woman and that's right. how this world affects me. But mostly she kind of doesn't. I mean, she has like a love story going on with Brainiac, but it's not, it, it becomes so much a part of her character. And I don't know, I don't know where the happy medium is. It is the happy medium, you know, now we know dreamer is sexually active. We've seen her in bed with Brainiac. So I mean, good. I, I'm happy with the CW shows and their efforts at kind of diversity and representation. I mean, I'm happy that they're at least trying, which is more than most of the Marvel properties have done, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yet at the same time, it can be a bit tokenistic in the sense that, you know, it can be sort of these moves where they're just trying to kind of get press for a casting or a storyline or something. And like the actualization of these things doesn't always live up to what it could be. But at the same time, like, I mean, a show like, you know, Legends of Tomorrow or something, I mean, would you argue that that has like the most kind of queer representation of any of the superhero shows or am I overlooking something? Well, okay. So Legends of Tomorrow at this point, Katie Lotz, who plays, um, who plays Sarah Lance is very much, very clearly the lead character. She is very clearly the star of the show. And since her character is bisexual, I would say she therefore almost necessarily is like it's it's front it's front and center except that batwoman same thing you know like um uh, the whether under both um the original batwoman kate kane and their newer character ryan wilder they're both supposed to be lesbians so it's part of the show is it tokenistic yes but also i mean I don't in a world where 99.99% of television shows don't have any LGBTQ recognition whatsoever. Can you do it without being tokenistic? I mean, when I wrote about I wrote something about Batwoman the first season when it originally came out and I kind of (laughs) I kind of tried to spin it as like because the show had gotten quite bad reviews and I think a lot of the bad reviews were justified. And yet by the same token, there can be something potentially powerful in this being a totally standard generic superhero show that happens happens to star a lesbian character. And I do think it was more than that in that case, because, you know, her lesbianism is central to the plot. You know, it's the reason that she has to leave the military academy and the sort of tension between her and her former girlfriend structures the show in an important way. So I don't think that 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 representation felt tokenistic necessarily. But 
you know, at the same time, you know, why can't we have queer characters in a super generic text? And maybe in a way that that's powerful because it shows that those metaphors are so easily adaptable to diverse mm-hmm. sexualities and they don't all have to be heteronormative. Mm-hmm. I mean, for Legends of Tomorrow, I was kind of thinking of like, I don't know, sort of the campiness of the show in general, like especially with like Wentworth Miller's portrayal of Captain Cold. And so I was just thinking of kind of like sort of the, the, it has sort of a queer text because of some of those kind of references, like even if it doesn't necessarily have the most queer characters. Yeah, I I loved him in that role. (laughs) I think he's I think he's perfect and yeah, yeah and, and he's interesting and he, he Wentworth Miller the person you know the actual person not the character um ha- has since said that um recently he said in an article that he has decided he's not playing any straight characters ever again and mm-hmm. I don't know if he'll stick to that but that, but that's where he is right now he feels mm-hmm. as though he's reached a point in his career where he needs he needs to stand up for representation so he's he's I don't know if he's willing to be bisexual or not but like the last couple of times I've seen him in anything, he was in a law and order recently where he was, he, he was just a gay man. And yeah. And I felt like always he made a choice to kind of do that character a certain way, like regardless of how it was written. I mean, can I ask you guys, how did you feel about the representation of Deadpool? Because that is an iconically, at least in comics, like queer or like bisexual or like, you know, I don't even want to put a label on Deadpool sexuality, but pansexual is what he said. Yeah. Is, yeah. Is what pansexual he, he would be good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. Like, how did you feel about the representation of him in the films, which like did some things like, you know, his like girlfriend pegs him for International Women's Day in the first movie. Right. And yet, Mm -hmm. how did you feel that his kind of was his pansexuality represented in the films or did you see it toned down for the films? Oh, I thought it was totally toned down. Um, did you? Okay, I'm wondering. Yeah, about, I, wow. I did. I, I mean, I, I did. Um, and I think that the, I, I mean, maybe not so much the movies, but the marketing definitely mm-hmm. uh, made like made some things just appear kind of le- like more more uh, traditional than perhaps Deadpool is as a character. And that's. Hmm. Well, I mean, the ways that both films are kind of structured around the loss of his girlfriend and his desire to regain that Mm -hmm. heteronormative relationship is, I mean, you know, I mean, whatever the heteronormative, but I mean, it's still like a heterosexual relationship. So, so here's the thing that I found really interesting about it. I'm wondering how you guys feel about it. So in those, in the second movie, the second Deadpool, um, what I found really, really interesting was, um, there were not so much marketing, more press around it. And then memes people were making from the press. People made a very big deal of Deadpool 2 is going to have the first explicitly LGBTQ characters starring in, in a superhero film. And then they had pictures of Yukio and Negasonic Teenage Warhead who in who have nothing to do with each other in the comics, but in in the world of the Deadpool universe are a couple. So it was like, oh, well, look, they're explicitly queer. See, and I'm like, and I I sat here and thought, but Deadpool is and it's his movie. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. (laughs) it is. So like so like I'm wondering it it was toned down. That's why I was wondering. I was curious about like Hannah's viewpoint, because I think it's toned down in that it's not his queerness is not a big plot point. I think it's there. I think that you have stuff like him squeezing Colossus's ass and saying, no, no, let it happen or whatever. You know, he does stuff like that, that I think gets p- played for laughs and isn't taken seriously, but isn't that how he is in the comics too? So I'm wondering is, is it just not, is it toned down or is it just that your, your stereotypical incel fanboy, you know, the, the cartoon picture of what a comic book, uh, a comic book fan is, which is, you know, not the four of us, right? I, I say <laughs> with pride, but, um, <laughs> but, um, but like the cartoon picture of what a comic book fan is supposed to be is, is, is that person just unaware that Deadpool is supposed to not be straight in the comics because it's not made a big enough, g- like, because if you're not Paul Lynn, to Wayne's earlier point, <laughs> do people just not know that you're pan or bi or gay? Like, well, do you and, have and, to be if, swishy? If, if, it, if it being played up, if it's being played up for laughs, that's that's a context in which they can accept it because you know locker room humor mm-hmm. and that sort of thing, and, right. and and they can kind of discount the actual sexuality of it. Right. So is that so? And that's that's why I'm wondering when, when Hannah said it was toned down. To me, it reads exactly the same way as. And I'm not a big fan of the Deadpool comics. I actually like the films way better than I re- like the comics. But I've read some of them, and to me, his you know 
his crushes on Colossus and Cable in the film read exactly like his cru- his crushes on Cable and more Spider Man in the comics. I would argue just the centrality of the relationship with the girlfriend is just a big factor in like whether you read it as toned mm-hmm. down or not. And I mean, mm. I think the playing gay as a joke is something that's present in the Deadpool comics and films. And it's, mm-hmm. yeah, again, like I, I think it's a problem with the character and the representation of his supposed pansexuality. And yet, when I think about Deadpool comics, he's just, there's been times where he's had female love interests that he's been very obsessive about, and yet all of his adventures aren't sort of centralized around the quest to regain the relationship with his girlfriend the same way as in the films. So in that sense, they read yeah. a straighter to me, but... Mm, okay. Yeah, like, I, he, like, if I, what? if I just... Um, if you ask me to explain the Deadpool films to you, it, it literally just centers around that relationship. I haven't seen them in a while, to be fair, Mm -hmm. but that is like my takeaway. Um, Mm -hmm. like you're, you're talking about like these other relationships and like, they're vaguely coming back to me as you explain it. But Mm -hmm. like the, the main like energy there seems to be focused around his girlfriend. If that makes sense. Right. Does he have explicit male lovers in the comics? Because I, I can think of people he's... And I'm, again, I'm not a huge Deadpool comic fan, but I'm only aware of male characters that he's flirted with who did not return his affections. Has he ever been in a relationship with... Uh, but whereas I know, for instance, he clearly had a relationship with Siren. He clearly had a relationship with Copycat in the comics. Um, Copycat's the Vanessa character from the film. Um, like they, he's clearly had romantic relationship with women in the comics. Uh, um, but I don't remember any romantic relationships with men that were returned. God, that's a really good yeah. question. And I feel like I should know the answer to that off the top yeah. of my head. And I certainly can't uh, think of an example off the top of my head, but we'll probably mm-hmm. get like a listener correcting us. Yeah. 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 If there is I, one, please leave a comment and let us yeah. know. Cause I, I don't, I yeah. don't know of one. I googled, I, I, I googled I, Deadpool's lovers and all the listicles feature women that are like just up on Google. Like, I mean, you know, take that okay. for what it's worth. But yeah. um yeah. So uh the, the the most memorable love interests, um, at least for like randos on the internet, are women. Mm-hmm. And that's you know, not surprising because of yeah. the you know what the internet fan culture is. But like I but like I would like to know if there is an explicit one there. Um and I and I don't mean like I you know I can certainly headcanon up a you know cable might have been said okay at one point I can believe that but but I mean something that's explicit like in the comics like he he clearly dated Siren for a while that was that was a storyline so that's that's what I'm wondering according to this um, article on sci-fi dot com uh, which mm-hmm. I can put in the show notes um, mm-hmm. Deadpool is pansexual yes but he has never had an on the page or on screen relationship with a man though the, this article points out no one has to perform their sexual sexuality for their identity to be valid um sure so so but you know but according to this article there hasn't and i think it's a little um old so there might be something new but Mm -hmm. historically no right so it's acknowledged but the films don't explicitly acknowledge it it's not like he wanders in and says hi i'm deadpool and as a member of the lgbtq community which you know if any character could get away with it, he would be the one, <laughs> you know, but he doesn't do that. Um, but as you said, I mean, to get back to our, our, our main thing about like how sexuality is portrayed in these books, um, it very, I mean, it's a little bit of a joke, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's a huge joke. It without judgment shows that he enjoys pegging. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, as silly as it sounds, I think that's a huge step. I think it is. I think, honestly, it's probably the most significant on-screen portrayal of super sex that we've had. I think it's the most mainstream portrayal of pegging um, <laughs> that we've that we've ever had. I mean, in the film period that I can think mm-hmm. of from, um, so, well, certainly um, male, uh, female on male. You're like, discounting like, porn here, right? No, mainstream. I'm saying it's the most mainstream um, example I can think of of a female character penetrating a male character in the history of cinema. I cannot think of it. Like I can think of examples of, of gay men being lovers on screen, Brokeback mountain. Right. Mm -hmm. But I cannot think of a more explicit. Yes. Sometimes men enjoy anal sex from their girlfriend. um, And that's that's not played for like as shameful. Like, I mean, it's played for humor a little bit, but I didn't feel like the humor of that scene sort of undercut that he's enjoying this. Like I, 
think like the humor sort of advertised the joy of the scene rather than the other way around. Yes. (sighs) And I mean, it's played for humor in the way that literally every other scene of that film is played for humor. They could have done it as, well, I'm only doing this for International Women's Day and we're never doing this again. But it's not that it, it it very much is a no this is a thing they do sometimes and i mean it's kind of odd to call deadpool you know the most sexually progressive film of all time but in that respect it kind of it's up there yeah i'm, well, I, I'm yeah. going to agree with you <laughs> I mean, which I mean, is but but like you said it's also it's one of the most explicit sexual scenes in mm-hmm. mainstream superhero cinema what else do we have in superhero cinema like cinema not much I mean you have Tony Stark you have you have um, you have Clark and Lois when he's not powered in the in in Superman 2 we, we have Watchmen um, we which can, is yeah we can talk special. about the Watchmen, Watchmen film yeah. and we can also talk about the TV show if you want <laughs> well okay, I think there's a lot I mean, of them on TV I mean like on mm-hmm. TV you absolutely have all the Netflix shows and you have like they're not going to show stuff on the CW shows but it's clearly there right mm-hmm. and and the Watchmen TV yeah. show as well and but we have, I think the, um, the Watchmen I mean, movie yeah what else was on Woman, screen? Uh, which is strange. Yeah. I, I, I actually, yeah, I, hit. in hindsight, I, I know that we've talked about Wonder Woman 1984 like very vaguely on this show since it came yeah. out. But well, you, you mentioned the issue because because we haven't really talked about it and. We didn't do a, we didn't do a recap episode on it, which we do on most big superhero shows, and we kind of passed on that one. So okay. you know, though, well, there was in, an insurrection in between. Yeah, <laughs> not uh, too. Yeah. So, so like, actually, Wonder Woman nineteen eighty four made me realize how strange, like, sex in Wonder Woman the uh, original film was. Um, but yeah, Wonder Woman nineteen eighty four. Um, if you haven't watched it, I guess you can stop listening to this and go watch it now. Um, so basically, Steve Trevor comes back through a wishing stone, but he doesn't come back in his body. He comes back in some other dude's body, though Chris Pine plays him throughout most of the film because it's all Diana sees and they have sex while he's in another person's body, which is super rapey and mm-hmm. is inexcusable. <laughs> I just want to point that out um, because there's been arguments over that for some reason. And some, then, of, some of them by Patty Jenkins. So yes, and then um, like at the end of the film, uh, Diana takes back her wish, and Steve disappears. But the dude is still like the dude whose body he borrowed is still living his life, and he and Diana have a moment that's supposed to be romantic to show she's moving on. But it's super creepy because he's like, "I don't know why you're talking to me, lady." And um, the and only she's, and she's giving him this look of, "I know what your penis looks like," and it's. Yeah. And my, it, it looks so yeah, creepy. I, actually, my father uh, proposed the only reason that this might might have made sense is that, like, maybe he was like, "What?" Well, I guess the original actor for Steve Trevor couldn't come back. And I was like, "No, Dad, that was the original actor for Steve Trevor uh, from *Miss the Film*." And he was like, "Oh, why would they do that? That's super weird and gross." And I was like, "Yeah, I know." But actually, the first film's super weird and gross because usually, um, like when women have sex in like a Victorian novel, it's like a uh, marriage. It's like you're dead. But instead, this time it was Steve Trevor just disappearing into the ether because mm-hmm. apparently, you know, you can't be happy in a relationship that's stable. You got to die. It was like Daisy mm-hmm. Miller, except Steve Trevor. Okay, I was wondering why you were going to say the original one was weird, but it's just because it's, because it's, he didn't survive it. It's like it's like but yeah, like people hmm. argue. Like I guess what Pat Jenkins argued is like, oh, it's a like the Wonder Woman nineteen eighty four is a like a reversal of like the weird rapey stuff that happens to women in these films, but they're just like repeating it instead of critiquing it. And yeah. it felt, and then I was like, oh, it's like the the early like nineteen hundreds. <laughs> Steve Trevor is the disposable like mm-hmm. love interest, and like he's fridged. He's he's yeah, he's, he's a fridged. woman in the refrigerator. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> it's, it's the thing we we're talking about with with Spider Man and Mary Jane and whatever. Just you can't have you can't have married happy characters. You know, like the, there's no closure to that. So that it takes away the potential for the story. Let people be that. happy and married if they want to be happy. Like there, there's a, there's different types of being married. You don't have to be married and have kids and stop doing things. Like people live after marriage. Like sorry, this is like or a you bigger could, thing. You know, but, yeah, no, but I, I'm, I'm saying. <laughs> or you can be that, married yeah, and unhappy. I mean, like yeah, that, but that's what I, we're I talking about with right. all this stuff. The, the idea that you know, we can't allow these characters to have 
normal lives. You know, there's something happens to them. There's, there's the, the Superman and ending. Superman and Lois have been married since what? 1994. Mm-hmm. Something like that. Um, like literally for 20, 25. No, I can't even do it. 25, 26 years of comics, something like that. It's fine. Sometimes they have marital yeah. problems. Sometimes they don't. It's interesting. Reed and Sue mm-hmm. have been married in comics for like 50 or 60 years. It's fine. You can do interesting stories. I don't know why we're very married to the idea of, well, I have theories as to why, yeah. but like, um, but we are, we are very tied into this idea of the lone superhero, mm-hmm. the masculine lone wolf, even when it's a feminine character like Wonder yeah. Woman. You know, you know we yeah, she's got to go because, it alone because the successful marriages are are by far the exception in mm-hmm. superhero comics. Um, and, and also, I mean, like goes, in other versions of entertainment too, sometimes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, w- w- very recently, and this was a little controversial, and I, you know, I guess they're trying to deal with it in Tom King's Batman and Catwoman series, but in in um, his Batman series, I hated him breaking up Selena and yeah. Batman because, frankly, having them be a couple who are going to get married and what does it mean to be a married Batman is the and Wayne knows this because I've said this yep. when he got me because Wayne got me to start buying Batman when I when he was like you've got to start reading this and I was like eh do I do I really and he's like trust me trust me and you do, and I did and I started reading it and I went back and I read them all and King's Batman was great for me up until the point where he breaks them up and she comes back and I, I get that he's doing a story but it really read as yeah I don't know how to tell them in a happy story so they've got to break up I, and she even says I, and I wonder how much of that was also direct mandate DC. yeah mandate because right. yeah. because the because her reasoning for breaking off their engagement is well if you're happy you can't be Batman bullshit just make yeah. him happy I I, I want to see him I want to see how he does this I want to yeah. see the story of and I like I liked seeing, um, again, the implied sexuality. It's not it's not a porn book, but it is very heavily implied that their sex life is, you know, much kinkier than like a tra- I mean, even from the very beginning of the reboot before much, he even took much, it over. Much, much kinkier than Clark and Lois, I'm sure. Right. And they and, you know, Catwoman and Batman are having sex on rooftops. They are adrenaline junkies like this is a, this is who they are, which makes them interesting to me in that I love that these two people who are superheroes because they want to be and because they really work hard are adrenaline junkies and have this crazy uh, sex life. And then I believe that the literal most powerful man on the planet, who's his friend, you know, Superman probably has the most mundane sex ever. That, yeah. so, that contradiction so, is interesting to me. Yeah. So are I you want telling to me, see that. I explored. So are you telling me to read this series because Batman and Catwoman were my first ship ever, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, should I read this series or will it just make me angry? Both. Um, it, <laughs> yes, it is. It, it is real. It is really good. Even the stuff post breakup is good. And they, re- it, and they resolve that to a certain, like they make that part of the larger plot. But it's irritating. I don't, don't want to give away. There, there's stuff yeah. that goes on that is irritating. There's actually several things that happen in that run where you can tell when something was forced on King versus when he's when, yeah, David when he, Grayson. Yeah, there's. I'm not going to give spoilers away because Hannah's gonna, if Hannah's going to read it. But the resolution to the Dick Grayson plot in Batman of you know there are in one issue there are four panels of Dick Grayson Dick Grayson that should have been by all logic. 20 issues of the series yeah and they told king he had to do it and he's like all right i'm gonna do it on one page that's all you get and and it's very clear and it's very clearly that how did we get an hour into a podcast about super sex and dick grayson's only coming up now (laughs) yeah i don't know can i can i put in a a, in a rec for like another tom king series that like because he he often does these kind of failed domestic storylines that this seems Mr. to be Miracle. a little bit of a writer obsession. I was going to say Mr. Miracle. I was really surprised Absolutely. by like sort of that the relationship, although it was dark and complicated and all of these things also ended up being loving and productive. And mm-hmm. I actually really liked the super sex in that series. And I was surprised mm-hmm. by how much I liked it. And I think that that's a far superior series to his vision series. and should be the one that he's known for. Oh, shots fired. I love them both. Uh, yeah. I do love, I, yeah. I do love both of those books, but make me choose between my children why don't you i mean like <laughs> I, yeah those are i mean ooh, that's that's tough 
As a big fan of like the 80s Vision Scarlet Witch stuff, I just can't with that like King Vision series. I love Vision having guilt free, okay. like connotatively queer, happy, joyous sex with Wanda in their suburban home and having it be this dark suburban tale. Like it's just a stop for me. I will say and I'll link both books in the show notes as well. I'll link yeah. um, Tom King's Vision series and Tom King's Mr. Miracle series. And w- with the caveat that if you enjoy Tom King as a writer and you enjoy Thinky literary books, Mr. Miracle is the way to go. Yeah. If you are going to be confused by not understanding, like if you visions is readable without um without understanding a lot of deep comic lore, that you're going to be there's a lot of places you're going to be lost in Mr. Miracle. Yeah. I've I've got a good hundred years of comic book lore just wrapping <laughs> around in my head at all times, and I get lost in Mr. Miracle. It's yeah. a it's a it's a trippy complicated book it, i mean it's like like when you say it's better i'm like well i mean but can i just recommend faulkner to a person and I can't, <laughs> right <laughs> i can't just tell you to go out and read faulkner no I, one I, should I, no I, one should do that to themselves it's hard enough right already. right but i understand but i understand how you might get there um, i think it's a more complicated more nuanced and ultimately more positive depiction of a superhero relationship so that would be oh, my absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. The relationship in Vision is horrible. Like Vision is, I don't think Vision's a happy story. I think ultimately Mr. Miracle is a happier story than Vision. And yeah, is. see what I like about it is it's a story that starts in suicide that ends up, you know, having the relationship. Be a produ- yeah, like it ends up being having the relationship like at the center as a hopeful thing. Whereas the Vision series is just what I don't like about it is it's a story that you can tell. But in terms of like Vision having, you know, for much of his history, a very kind of joyful romantic mm-hmm. life it just it seemed like it was taking away from one of the few characters that had had that joyful romantic life and for a yes. brief time a joyful marriage so that is sort of part of my issue with it i think it's a good series for what it is i just don't yeah. like that mm-hmm. version yeah. of the vision as a character yeah. and, and unfortunately that also builds off of the, just the horrible treatment that wanda has undergone yeah. in Marvel yeah. for the last mm-hmm. few years do we want to talk at all about the show this is now it's it's kind well, of weird because we, we are all all four of us are hopelessly addicted to the WandaVision show. Yeah, we're going to do an entire episode on it. So. Yeah. We're going to have an episode about it that airs, but it's, it's with the taping schedule, as people are listening to us today, and assuming you're as addicted to WandaVision as we are, you are two episodes ahead of where we are at taping time. Right, yeah. Yes. So, so which is weird, right? We are on episode five right now. But as you listen to this, if our if I understand our taping, Hannah, you're better at this. But I believe on our release schedule, the listeners are on episode seven. No, I think they're actually on episode six. Okay, but but still, they're they're you're ahead, uh, which is why I you know when I ca- casually like mentioned Wandavision at the beginning of the show, I was like, can I say this? I I read an interview with Paul Bettany uh, like yesterday, and he said, you know, the show's moving forward in time, and some of the sitcoms were paying like honor to like the the husbands and wives on those shows don't really like each other and i think that Mm -hmm. fits with the story we're going to tell and Mm -hmm. that sounds extremely ominous Mm -hmm. well i will say and this isn't a spoiler i'll just say my hopes for wandavision which i sadly suspect and this is not a spoiler it's just something i suspected from the outset will be dashed was that i really wished that it could be a dark romantic tale but one in which in some sense love still triumphs within that darkness (laughs) and my fear for for it is that they're going to go with a bad portrayal of Wanda as a woman who can't handle her power and is yeah. harming everyone around her mm-hmm. through her loss of control. And I will be so sad if that's <laughs> where it yeah. ultimately goes. And I'm just praying. <laughs> My feeling right now is it's going to do a Wonder Woman 1984 where it's like you are a woman who can't let go of a man and you're making bad decisions because you can't let go of someone. Uh, and, and the whole point of ever how long the narrative arc is, is that you have to learn to let go and deal with your grief. Um, it's just that when we read some of the things that you can read into the WandaVision relationship, you know, it was originally kind of an interracial interracial relationship metaphor. It also has like connotations of queerness. So that message that she has to let go and she's living in a delusion, it's really problematic to yeah. me like within those contexts. So I'm very curious to see how it ends. I have enjoyed some of the beginning of it, but I'm nervous about how it's going to end. Mm-hmm. 
And it's odd because I actually, you know, transitioned to that because I figured you'd want to talk about Vision's penis a little bit more. But, <laughs> but, 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 yeah, but no, I, I think that I, I, I agree with all of it. I there's the issue of, you know, the very trope of, oh, power drives women mad. You know, so there's yeah. all I, I see that I see that. I also, though, see that this is given where the character has been. I think that if they if they go that direction, it does give them potential to explore her in the future in the Marvel Universe. But villains don't always turn. I mean, I, I want her to be an ongoing force because I, I oh, well, very we, much enjoy Lizzie Olsen's acting. Well, we know that she'll be back for yeah, we know she's gonna be in Doctor Strange. So and right. I'm, I'm but assuming how, but how much. But like, uh, also, how long can she like, like, I, like, I don't want her. I don't love what Wanda has become in the Marvel Comics universe. Yeah. As uh, far no. as, yeah. Um, whereas I find um, um, Lillian Robinson, who wrote a book called Wonder Women, um, does this analysis of the Wanda character in her in her book where she talks about how she is, in Robinson's view, a, you know, at the time of her writing that. Um, a very feminist character who owned her own sexuality in many, many ways. And then she also acknowledges there are many ways in which she doesn't, you know, <laughs> there, um, and, and which are sort of problematically, oh, because you know, stories written by men for men. But, you know, she's trying to say there's, there's a lot of progressiveness to the character. So I think that's good. But so much of it was stripped away with House of M and with, like, with what they've done with the character because she can't be allowed to have marital bliss. Um, like I actually, even after the, dis the dissolving of her relationship with Vision, I love the relationship between Simon, who Wonder Man in the comics and Wanda. I thought it was massively fascinating. The argument that, you know, Simon, who considered Vision a brother, wasn't willing to give his brainwaves over back to recreate Vision because he was like, yeah, obviously I'm in love with Wanda. Vision is me and he's in love with Wanda. So, yeah, I am. And like, like I found that to be an interesting storyline and it's complex. And Robinson makes the point that, you know, they could have just had, you know, they are fantastic beings. Why can't she just choose as a woman to see them both? And that's never addressed in the comic. But after that, they sort of destroy that as well. And she just becomes crazy woman who destroys the universe. Yeah. Yeah. If Wanda is going to be a villain, the only satisfying way. And again, we're not saying this is what happens, but it's just the only satisfying way that I could see to do that was if she was sort of like a feministly informed villain and her rage is a feminist rage for men manipulating her in some way. So that's the only way that I'd be OK with that. Mm -hmm. Although I feel like there's... I feel like in the show, there's Hydra has to be involved somehow because of all those evil looking commercials that like hinted something going on there. And like capitalism is evil. Hydra is evil. I don't know what how, what the connection is, but maybe I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that, was the best, was, that was the best explanation of it whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's the connection. Yep. yep. <laughs> I mean, we see. we're we're like recording at nine at night. I'm surprised mm -hmm. anything I say yeah. is semi coherent. Yeah, well, and at, at this point, not only have we not resolved anything, we've also like there's lots of things that we talked about talking about that we didn't get to talk about. So, right. Well, well, I mean, so, so I, I I'm going to say like we do have a lot of our topics uh, to be continued, and let's come back and talk about super people and sex again sometime. Yeah, you you yeah. will you will see super sex return. <laughs> dot dot dot. Um, just, just give us a little while to recover, and we'll be back with more. Yeah, same box pop time, same box pop channel. Um, no, a, and we haven't even addressed which superpower is the best for sex. Hey, okay, real quick. Wait, wait, so, if you're not going to pick super stretching, what do you pick? Daredevil has super senses. I'm just saying. So, for his own benefit or for the other person's? Both. Okay, I'm just. I, I just wasn't sure which how how you were going with that because. <laughs> I mean, my other bay, the Silver Surfer, has like the power cosmic too and i mean potentially limitless potential for things okay, you could do so with him yes. <laughs> yes anybody who has like massive energy you know like anybody who can just rewrite reality i think that, that that's just cheating right you know why even have sex just be like oh by the way you had an orgasm so did i it was the best ever so <laughs> well, moving on like he could just wave his hand and just decide that it's so. true but i mean i'll <laughs> yeah. reiterate too if you want something a little bit more grounded nightcrawler prehensile tail skin that feels like velvet yeah, that works. <laughs> Tiger, Tiger's in that category as well. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's got plenty of appeal. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hannah? Oh, sorry. I'm just stuck on like super, super strength cannot be good. Then, yeah. Um, <laughs> Unless you also had that. super strength, so it yeah. kind of depends, maybe. I, I think, yeah, I you're think just that, careful. You know, I think that as an, as a 17 year old, I read Twilight and I'm like, mm, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe like in this one case, Edward had a correct concern, except he was also being super creep about it. So, <laughs> no, thank you, Edward. Um, my, my few points of all things are not informed by Twilight. I just want to make that clear if any <laughs> listeners just like run long enough to hear this. <laughs> Wayne, I yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I, I need to uh, play all of these out in my imagination. <laughs> we resolved nothing. We can't yeah, even resolve make a chart. This. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Anyway, um, Anna, thank you for joining. Yeah, we definitely will do this again. Mad, you're not going to um, respond I'm to sure this th- question? Huh? Oh, I said. I, oh, I said earlier. I mean, like telekinesis. Any, yeah, any you know, uh, telekinesis okay. and force and force bubbles, like uh, like all the all all of the lifting things. Like there, there's so much there. <laughs> um, yeah, and again for a male or a female from any point of view like mm-hmm. you know um benefits to yourself benefits to your partner i absolutely um being able to levitate stuff or especially if um there's two things cuz it's not clear to me whether telekinesis has any feel to it. Like, I don't want the power to just levitate. I mean, I guess it's neat if you can just like levitate a, a dildo across the room or something like that. But, um, but like the way I usually read the way Gene's powers are constructed or indefinitely Sue Storms is there is a force behind it. You can, you know, push on stuff, right? But so, I was automatically so- assuming that it would have sensation. And now I'm all like, wow, my brain is like so dirty that I automatically assumed <laughs> that rather than the opposite. Right, right. And I, I, I just, assume that there would be sensation as opposed to just you are manipulating magically floating something through the air but yeah yeah, yeah, you have to be able to feel it to be able to manipulate right right so that's so that's so that's my thought um but yeah i i I think um that's definitely where i would go i approve of this answer (laughs) (laughs) uh but anyway anna thank you for joining us uh, tell people where they can find you, find more about your work. Sure. Uh, I have a podcast called Three Panel Contrast. You can find us on Twitter, Twitter at number three panel contrast or wherever you get your podcasts. I have another podcast with Mav actually called the Oh Gosh, oh, so oh Yeah, called the Oh Gosh, Oh Golly, Oh Wow podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Gosh Golly Wow. We have a website wherever you get your, it, it will be launching a week after this comes out, I think. Um, it's, mm-hmm. a, it's a podcast in which we are rereading the Marvel comic series Excalibur. And I was editing our first episode today, and there is substantial discussion of sex <laughs> in that first episode. So the conversation about super sex continues there. Mm-hmm. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Papard underscore Anna. You can find my writing in various places online. I will wreck my piece on the Vision's penis called Behold the Vision's Penis um, <laughs> for, for the middle spaces. Um, if you look that up, you will find it and we can link it in the show notes. But yeah, mm-hmm. that's some of what I get up to. <laughs> oh, and of course, my book, Super Sex, Sexuality, Fantasy and the Superhero, which you can purchase everywhere now. Yep. All of that link to the show notes or uh, I'll, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> I'll drum, Hannah. Uh, you know, um, <laughs> you know, donate money to a food bank. Uh, <laughs> if you can afford it, uh, we'll keep the link to Feed America in the show notes. Also, I discovered that Fringe is available for free on IMD TV. Uh, so you can watch it and know what I'm talking about. These like past <laughs> few episodes because I keep referencing it because it's what I'm doing with my life. And Wayne, I got nothing new. Use <laughs> <laughs> links in the show notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, same ones as always. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've, I've lost track of where, where, and when we are in, 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 in podcast time travel. February fifteenth. It's February fifteenth. It's the day after Valentine's Day. You're probably a little okay. hungover. Okay. Oh yeah, I'm totally. I, I had a great night last night. Um. Um. Yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> um, but, but um. But theoretically, I was on. I guess theoretically, I'm launching our new podcast. Gosh, golly, well, next week. According to what Anna just said, mm-hmm. and I think last week I was on 
um, the Disney Animation Minute Essentials po- podcast, where you can listen to me talking about sex and the little and the Little Mermaid, which is you know also kind of a con- uh, kind of a um, continuation of this. And I think I was on three episodes. I think Hannah's on that show next week or in two weeks. Again, podcast I, time travel confuses me. <laughs> I don't know. I'll eventually be on. Um, <laughs> I'll you should listen to that going. show. It's a good show. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good show. <laughs> um, you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, all of the places, always at Chris Maverick. You can follow the show, all those same places, always at Vox Popcast. And you can follow the show's blog at www.voxpopcast.com, where you can find out about what we're talking about next week. Um, it's probably something weird like this. I don't know, but you can leave comments on our calls for comments. You can sort of influence what we talk about when we're on the air. Sometimes we pick people to be guests that way and you can, you know, just let us know what you think of this. Like, cause I'm sure somebody's going to be like, dude, obviously Deadpool dated whoever, you know, put that in the comment. Let us know. Cause, uh, cause I do like learning stuff like that. If you enjoy the show, and we certainly hope you do, then please subscribe to us on iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify or wherever the hell else you get podcasts from. And do us a favor. Leave us a five-star review, especially if you leave a five-star review on iTunes. That really helps us out. It especially helps us out if you don't just rate us, but if you write a little something, something. If you just like write a review that says, um, these people are weird. They're obsessed with robot penises and super stretching, but it's a good show. Five stars. Uh, or, you know, eugen- eugenics bad. Or, or <laughs> roses are red, violets are blue. I love this show, and so should you. Oh, and, that's right. And, it's and, I should, Day. and I should get off the internet now. <laughs> <laughs> and also do us a favor subscribe to us on our YouTube channel. Um, that really helps the show. We're trying to get more people subscribing there. Um, and you can watch the show, you can listen to the show, and also watch and see pictures of the stuff that we're talking about which on this particular episode do you want to do you not i'm not sure but it's going to be real interesting see you know i've got to edit this show and put it together and figure out how i'm going to show but not show the vision's penis and not get bumped off of youtube so you know this is your chance to figure out what exactly i did i'm sure i'll censor it with um with a comics code symbol or something um anyway so subscribe to us on youtube and I would like to thank Maximilian of Thought for Music for our epic theme song, building ever so more epically and playing us out. I'd once again like to thank Anna for joining us. I'd like to thank you at home for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. But you know, I think you ought to get him some help. He seems to be really hung up on superhero sex organs. But he'll outgrow it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>